We have to honor our personal truths and not abandon ourselves out of some idealistic um, but mistaken fantasy about what a highly spiritual person might do and think if you know, they've absolutely merged with um, the universal world because that fantasy, that comparison actually separates us from the simple truth of what's happening. Welcome to the Be Here Now guest podcast. This series features a collection of teachings and conversations centered around mindfulness, spiritual growth, and living a life in balance. Each week, our diverse network of guest teachers and hosts offer up wisdom and practices from a different spiritual path and perspective. If you would like to support this podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash donate. Tonight's talk is uh, us as the world and the world as us, the two truths. Speaking to you tonight, I'm just so aware that this is a really deep time in the retreat. It's one of the deepest times. And there are two truths expressed in this too. One is the truth of anicca, of impermanence of the retreat time passing and the sense of spiritual urgency, that this is it. And one thing my mind used to do in retreats was start to fantasize about the next retreat. Like, okay, in the next retreat, I'll get enlightened or, you know, whatever it was. So to realize this is it, and to have that sense of spiritual urgency, while at the same time feeling there's all the time in the world, there's plenty of time left. We still have lots of time. So just enjoy and stay in as much as you can. The two truths that I want to talk to you about tonight um, it's really what I mostly always talk about are uh, the truths of this relative or personal world and the absolute or universal world and how they connect. And uh, just a glimpse of the two truths from my time with my mother that I had this weekend. My mother's doing fine. She's going to be 88. In April, she has cancer and she's uh, feeling okay. It's, it's fine right now. And she would reassure you if you asked her how she's doing. She would say, well, you know, I do have cancer, but my tumors don't grow. And that's her truth. Now, there are two truths. There is my mother's truth. And there's the truth of her oncologist. And we're blessed that she has a doctor who respects her truth while letting her know about his whenever she cares to ask. But since she's feeling okay, she doesn't ask. Uh, She really doesn't have any inclination to ask. And this is her way. And it really works for her. She loves her life. But there's something about being aware of the, the impermanence the anicca of it, when we're paying close attention to how things change and when they vanish. And it's both freeing and poignant at the same time. I mean, it's the freedom of this too shall pass, all things shall pass. It's a very good news when we're suffering. But it's the poignancy, too, of all things are passing every moment now. And our ability as human beings to anticipate the moment when something or someone or we ourselves will pass away for good. Well, here's a poem. Our life ends. Nothing can prevent our death. 
In the meantime, this floating, fluid, free-form world reveals such infinite tenderness. Even our grieving and thinking selves know that it's spring. The fruit and almond trees are in bloom. Their blossoms giving, giving, giving their luminous dana. The jasmine buds are opening, offering their bright fragrance. We're so thirsty for this dharma. It waters the heart. Saturday night, I was laughing with my mother. We watched mating season with luscious lip Jean Tierney. Long dead now, like the whole cast. I snuggled up to her as close as she would let me. Just don't mess up my hair. Loving her in the light of the flickering TV, held by all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, kept company by the one who knows. I remember. Buddha nature pervades the whole universe, revealing itself right here, right now, on the beige couch, as this self reaching for another piece of dark-clad toffee. Amazing, this life we share. How sweet it is to be in it together. And how poignant, by appreciating the presence while being acutely aware of the absence, her passing away, and mine too, and holding both truths in my heart. I incline my mind, heart, my the chitta, toward this vanishing point, the disappearing side of life. This um this silent source from which we arise and to which we return. Now just notice the moment when the sound of the bell vanishes, to notice the moment when things vanish. This is a very um, powerful practice. Listen all the way to its vanishing point. And then what remains in the stillness, emptiness, silence, true self, Buddha nature, cessation, papasara citta. This is a beautiful expression that the Buddha used, the papasara citta, the radiant mind, the radiant heart, the mind heart of clear light. This is what Eugene was talking about last night, this citta. And that its brightness isn't something we have to produce or contrive, but it's the intrinsic nature of the mind-heart. So, a New Yorker cartoon. A couple of hikers are sitting at the edge of a cliff. They're resting And they're looking out over this vast vista of beautiful mountains. And one of them says to the other, I don't know if he says it to her, it could be her saying it to him, I could sit here all day thinking about my problems. This is the world of the relative, the world of form. Us, life in this particular form, this oh-so-personal manifestation of the impersonal, And emptiness, all that space of mountain and sky, of the big mind, the big heart, uh, life in the form of the awareness that holds it all when we tune into it. So the Heart Sutra names these two truths, form and emptiness. It's a great Mahayana Sutra. And I want to celebrate them both and some great teachers and practitioners who can inspire us and help us uh, really align ourselves, our personal selves, with this universal movement of life. So, and whether you know it or not, whether you, you are actually, all of you, discovering this in your retreat now. 
So in the Heart Sutta, the Buddha is listening. And he's sitting in his samadhi, and he's listening to Avalokiteshvara, one of his disciples, answer Shariputra's question about emptiness. That form is empty, was one of the Buddha's earliest and most frequent teachings. So see if you can listen in your samadhi, the samadhi of the end of the day, maybe tiredness, maybe relief to be hearing a talk. It was just listening like um, Shakyamuni Buddha, Muni Shakya, uh, Muni of the Shakya clan, Muni meaning the silent one. And at this point in the retreat, I think the Dharma talks is probably like listening to bird songs or or the frogs, or, you know, just let it gently land in your heart, like the Zen master of old Korea who used to walk through town and he would be ringing a bell and saying, Dayan, Dayan, don't think, don't think. So this is just an ode to emptiness. You can rest and listen and let the thoughts blow by like today's clouds. It goes like this. O Shariputra, form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Form is not different from emptiness. Emptiness is not different from form. That which is form is emptiness. That which is emptiness is form. Thich Nhat Hanh's version. Form is the way and emptiness is the water. Sounds kind of like Suzuki Roshi that uh, Eugene read last night. Wave is water, water is way. These truths contain each other. These two contain each other. Because one exists, everything exists. Achan Cha says it this way. You should know both the, uni- both the universal and the personal, the realm of forms, and the freedom to not cling to them. The forms of the world have their place, but in another way, there's nothing there. To be free, we need to respect both these truths. So this doctrine was actually developed in order to avoid confusion about the Buddha's teachings on emptiness and no self. For example, uh, you know, we ask, how can I live my everyday life without a self? Or How can I reconcile the me that wants to eat the chocolate that's put out for the eight precepts yogis with the me who is the one who knows? Both are true. Lila says it this way. The way is difficult and very intricate. Lila discarded her books that told about it and through meditation saw the truth that never comes to anyone through reading about it, from reading words. This is the truth of suchness that John was talking to us about. Outside your door is a land of stillness and light. Outside the mind door, the door to our mind house, is a land of stillness and light. This Pabasara Chitta, spring comes and the grass grows by itself. So these two truths weave around each other, inseparable and equally true, like tantra, which means weave, the weave of the sacred and the profane of the spiritual world and the conventional world. It's kind of like, um, you know, the DNA molecule forming this double helix. And it's really the whole of life from which we can never be separate. From Galileo, all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. And from Mary Oliver, her expression of it. The god of dirt came up to me many times and said so many wise and delectable things. I lay on the grass listening to his dog voice, crow voice, frog voice. Now, he said, and now and never once mentioned forever, which has nevertheless always been like a sharp iron hoof at the center of my mind. 
For years and years, I struggled just to live my life. And then the butterfly rose, weightless in the wind. Don't love your life too much, it said, and vanished into the world. Just as the self, just as we vanish into experience when we're wholeheartedly present. Don't love your life too much, she said. It's like T.S. Eliot in Ash Wednesday. He says, teach us to care and not to care. And he says, I pray that I may forget these matters that with myself I too much discuss. Too much explain. May the judgment not be too heavy upon us. Because these wings are no longer wings to fly, but merely Vans to beat the air, the air which is now thoroughly small and dry. Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. When we can let go of trying to control experience, of trying to avoid the thoroughly small and dry, and just in case you thought you were alone in trying to control experience, The writer Gerald Durrell said, if you can control your family, you've somehow gone terribly wrong. This is some encouragement for us. So when we can trust what's happening and be with it instead of trying to control it, as we saw, even in working with difficult emotions, this can be a way to allow the personal to open the door to the universal. This is a poem. I've changed it so much, I can hardly... But it is Bridget Lowry's poem, originally. In the strange early morning half-light, we sit. In the cloudiness of our confusion, we sit. In our madness and our clarity, we sit. In the midst of too much, we sit. In community and in loneliness, we sit. In hope and fear and spring breezes, we sit. In the great arms of the cosmos, we sit. In the blazing energy of being alive, we sit. One of the most beautiful and inspiring examples of the two truths, of a monk who lived the two truths, um, and I told this story last year, is about the Cambodian monk, Maha Gosananda, He passed away last March during our retreat, so we offered some tributes to him. He was known as the Gandhi of Cambodia and was really a giant among world Buddhist teachers and a tireless worker for peace. This supreme head monk of Cambodia, Maha Gosananda, traveled with a group of us on pilgrimage to uh, Korea, to the great Zen temples of Korea. He came with us twice, once to China and once to Korea. And even though it was hot and humid, he always bundled up in all his robes and a blanket, and he wore this knit um, stocking cap. It was an old kind of, um, looked like he got it from a free box somewhere. And he really looked like kind of a bag monk. Um, (laughs) along with the Korean monastic dignitaries and some uh, Western teachers, he was invited to give a Dharma talk at Sudok Sa Temple, and it was attended by hundreds and hundreds of monastics and some of us lay people. He stood up in his simple Theravadan robes, and he said, in the language of the country that colonized his, Je suis... Tu es, elle est, nous sommes, vous êtes, ils sont, elles sont. He stood at the podium and quietly, slowly conjugated the verb être, to be. He said, I am. You are, she is, he is, we are, 
They are. They are. So simple. That was his Dharma talk. So completely true and completely clear. He gave his talk without notes. (laughs) They all did, actually. But it was Maha Gosananda who radiated such metta and karuna, such love and compassion. He transmitted such a strong and unmistakable wave of blessing that we sat and wept, just just tears of recognition of such unmistakable tenderness, infinite love and tenderness was his dharma. He hardly said anything up in front of that illustrious assembly, and yet, and yet, He broke our hearts wide open, standing there speaking French. And it was, this was in 1987. So it was before the genocide in Cambodia had actually ended. And he could hold both truths the truth of emptiness, the open field of being where we simply are together, and the truth of his work in the refugee camps with survivors of the killing fields where he lost all 17 of his brothers and sisters. But none of this went through our heads at the time. It didn't have to. Words were not necessary, and the majority of the people there couldn't even understand them. But it didn't matter. His presence standing there so soft, so humble, so quiet, said it all, just wordless words that were perfectly clear. The metta, the wisdom of pure being, the kindness that holds it all. Another deep expression of these two truths, Suzuki Roshi talks about things falling out of balance against a background of perfect balance. One yogi talked about being on a walk and realizing that even here in the midst of this great beauty, maybe especially here in some ways because it was such a beautiful day, but she was depressed. And the contrast, of course, is even more painful because there doesn't seem to be any reason for it. But she was depressed and she was completely identified with it. Uh, Just, you know, look, this is who I am. I'm depressed. I'm here in heaven and in the middle of my retreat. And, but, and, and she reacted to this with dismay at first, but then her mindfulness kicked in and she recovered and looked more deeply and she saw, oh, this is what depression is like. It's like this. My, my arms hang down. My head feels like this. There's a stuck, contracted place here. So again, being mindful and willing to explore the being out of balance. Something unexpected happened, and I bet you can guess what it is, which is that her depression changed. Working with hunger on the eight precepts, she also saw that this too is a universal experience, the experience of hunger. And connecting with all the beings who dwell in realms where their hunger can never be satisfied. She felt an upwelling of compassion in her heart. Perfect balance. As Jack Cornfield said the other day, the end of becoming is not the stopping of any process, but the end of the person who becomes the end of taking experience to be myself and becoming it, that is, becoming identified with it over and over. It's so important to hold both truths in the heart. Sometimes people in spiritual circles tend to privilege the absolute or universal truths One woman I worked with very closely was angry and upset because her husband was having an affair. She spoke with the woman that her husband was having the affair with, and she told her 
how mad she was and how betrayed she felt because they were part of the same community. The woman reproached her for expressing intense anger, how unspiritual of you, and said to her, but we're all one, we're all the same. (laughs) This really happened. Now, from one point of view, that's true. That's true. But when it's time to make love with your partner, it's kind of important to know that you're unique, that you're not completely interchangeable with every other being in the world. (laughs) Because after all, we're all the same, right? We have to honor our personal truths and not abandon ourselves out of some idealistic Um, but mistaken fantasy about what a highly spiritual person might do and think if they absolutely merged with um, the universal world. Because that fantasy, that comparison, actually separates us from the simple truth of what's happening. Aitken Roshi puts it this way. When someone speaks of no self, I vow with all beings to be sure there is no contradiction. The speaker is there, after all. When someone speaks of no self, I vow with all beings. That's one of his verses, his gathas. To be sure there's no contradiction. The speaker is there, after all. Seeing emptiness means seeing what the Buddha wanted us to see, as he said in the Diamond Sutra. So you should view this fleeting world, a star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a flickering cloud, in a summer cloud, a flickering lamp, a phantom, and a dream. That word dream, it evokes such a sense of lightness and ease like we don't have to take it quite so seriously, whatever it is, that we can hold these two truths that are precious human birth. It's a unique opportunity, mostly because of this amazing gift of consciousness. And yet, it's so ephemeral too. Dust in the wind, a grain of sand. This is a quote from the Uh, Buddha of Tibet, Padmasambhava. While my view is as vast as the sky, my actions are as finely ground as barley flour. So he's really expressing his intention to honor both truths, that boundless clear sky that isn't bothered by any clouds. And at the same time, the recognition that no action is inconsequential. Every cloud matters in some way. That there's not even any movement that is inconsequential is what Ticha is teaching in Qigong. It's what the great Zen master Rinzai was pointing to when he said, there is nothing that is not sacred. There's nothing that is not profound. And one yogi realized this through her Qigong practice, she realized that no part of any movement is unimportant, that the whole arc of any gesture is important. And she found herself reaching for a door with the same flowing attentiveness as in Qigong, noticing the opening, expanding movements, alternating with the gathering, embracing gestures, that rhythm of expansion and contraction of ebb and flow of breathing in and breathing out, of rising and falling, that it's possible to move through the day this way when there's continuity of mindfulness. In Qigong, Tija said it's called Zan Shin, unbroken spirit, just as these trees and hills exist in their unbroken samadhi, their unbroken spirit, we too can move through the days of retreat this way, unbroken by resistance and or doubt, unbroken not because they don't come up, but because they too can be included. Twenty-two. 
25 years ago, before the Dalai Lama was ever famous, his smiling face was on the cover of a newsprint paper that came out then. It actually still comes out, but I don't know if it's still newsprint, um, but it was called The Snow Lion uh, from Ithaca. And what it said, it struck me so powerfully that I, I actually cut it out and put it up in my kitchen where it just yellowed and tattered over the years. And that piece of paper is long gone, but I always remember his his familiar smiling face. He was a lot younger then, saying, maybe I am the last Dalai Lama. It's all right. There's nothing wrong. His hands were in prayer position, and he was saying, Maybe I'm the last Dalai Lama. It's all right. There's nothing wrong. I couldn't imagine feeling that, that it could be okay for a whole lineage and tradition of country, of family, of culture, of religion to disappear in that genocide that was happening in Tibet. And I couldn't imagine how he, of all people, knowing how much his people count on him for their guidance and courage, how he could say that, but his words had the ring of truth, and they can inspire our practice through very dark times in our life. I remember more than once sitting in the midst of great suffering, just tears coming down my face while deeply knowing that it was all right. It's not the all right of complacency, or dismissal, or denial. It's the big all right. It's the all right of particular things continually falling out of balance against a backdrop of perfect balance. It's the all right of being able to open to experience and be present with it, to be with it, to be it to drink life straight up. As Layla, the poet, says, meditate within eternity. Don't stay in the mind. Your thoughts are like a child fretting near its mother's breast, restless and afraid, who with a little guidance can find the path of courage. And it really does take courage. It's hard. It goes against the grain against the stream, as the Buddha and Noah Levine say. When I was traveling in China on the pilgrimage with my first teacher, Desan Sanim, who also took us to Korea, and Venerable Mahagosananda was there on that trip too, we visited many ancient Zen temples, including the one where Dogen Zenji stayed during his visit um, from Japan to practice Chan in China. And the Buddhist temples are laid out as a map of consciousness. And so you go through different gates, and the gates have guardians, and um, the guardians, the first set of guardians are, they look kind of like bandits. They're these towering figures by the gates, and they're meant to be quite frightening and then you go past them, and then you, there's a second gate with a second set of big, tall, huge guardians. And, but these are very pleasant, and one plays a lute. And of course, we can all relate to these distractions, and in some ways, the terrifying ones are the easiest ones to recognize. And the first gate, those ones of guarding the second gate, often are harder to see. Anyway, when you get in toward the center, there's um, the hall of the 18 arhats. These are beings who embody 18 different kinds of spiritual strength. And they were really huge golden statues um, sitting all around the walls of the room. And so when you walk in, you're just surrounded by towering golden arhats on all sides. And they had fantastic human faces. Each one was unique and uh, like us, Each one assume different postures that illustrate their qualities of their heart. 
Um, my favorites were, there was one with very, very long eyebrows, so long he had to hold them like this. They would come out of his eyes and then pour down to the ground. And it was, it looked like real hair too coming out of the statue. And, um, it said that if you're honest, your eyebrow, if you're completely honest, your eyebrows will grow. So anyway, uh, and then there was, uh, the Arhat who had he had plunged his hands into his chest and pulled his chest open, exposing the layers of flesh under that golden skin. And it was all raw and painted blood red. And his face was completely serene as he dug his hands into his chest and tore open his heart just as you all have such serene and beautiful faces as you sit in the hall with the courage to let your hearts open. Sometimes opening, blossoming in bliss, sometimes breaking. And the opening in his chest exposed his heart, and in his heart was a small golden Buddha. Just have to make a decision. Well, it may be a welcome decision. I think this will be a shorter talk. Um, This is a poem by Adrian Rich called Power. Living in the earth deposits of our history... Today a backhoe divulged out of a crumbling flank of earth. One bottle, amber, perfect. A hundred-year-old cure for fever or melancholy, a tonic for living on this earth in the winters of this climate. Today I was reading about Marie Curie. Marie Curie, she must have known she suffered from radiation sickness. Her body bombarded for years by the element she had purified. It seems she denied to the end the source of the cataracts on her eyes, the cracked and separating skin of her finger ends till she could no longer hold a test tube or a pencil. She died a famous woman, denying her wounds. Denying her wounds came from the same source as her power. To be whole and complete on our spiritual path, We need to honor the full catastrophe, the darkness and the light, the relative and the absolute, the personal and the universal, the whole spectrum of our experience of humanness, where anger is truth, sorrow is truth, joy is truth, life and death, pleasure and pain. There, here, is the sure heart's release, a freedom that comes when we stop denying our wounds and instead allow our hearts to transform, to transform them into wisdom and compassion. Because even in the face of the oceans of suffering in this world, there is the joy in our practice, the joy that we can sit and walk and open ourselves to these two truths. Life continually falling out of balance against this background of perfect balance. 
we can face our broken hearts and with poignant joy, like that joy I felt with my mom Saturday night. With poignant joy, we can give praise. And this is from a Zen student named Leonard Cohen. Even though it all goes wrong, I stand before the Lord of Song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. Even though it all goes wrong, I stand before the Lord of Song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. So let's end this talk with a chant of praise. So please chant with me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We'll do it one more time. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Don't we do things three times always in Buddhist practice? Okay, once more. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let's always sit for a minute. Thank you for your practice and your Shakyamuni listening. <clears throat>